Ladies and gentlemen, it is an absolute pleasure to be here before you this afternoon. And I stand here today with a very modest proposal. The proposal is this. The generations X and Y, generally those under age 45, deserve a chance. A chance to deal with lower wages and higher costs of living today without compromising either the families they have now or the families they may one day want. Now you might be thinking, in a country like Canada, surely that chance is far more common than I'm suggesting. For one, our economy has more than doubled in size since 1976. And when you control for population growth, we now produce an extra 35 grand per household on average. But that average increase in prosperity is simply not trickling down to younger generations today. If you take the typical 25 to 34 year old working full time, her or his wages are down several dollars an hour, even though she or he is twice as likely to have post-secondary certificate of some sort compared to the past. And because so many more people are getting post-secondary today, they're starting out with larger student debts than ever before, in part because tuition is also higher than it was in the past. And with jobs that pay lower wages, often few if any pensions, with larger student debts, young people are starting out having to pay housing prices that have nearly doubled. Yes, the very housing prices that have gone up so much over recent decades, which are driving up the wealth of the typical tw uh, 55 to 64 year old in this country, literally nearly tripling it over a generation compared to the same age group in the past, is precisely the same housing trend which is crushing the dreams of home ownership for far more younger people today than ever before and making it far more challenging for young people to get a financial foothold. Think about it. Back in 1976, it took the typical 25 to 34 year old five years of full-time work to save a 20% down payment on a home in an average school district. Across the country, it now takes 10 years. In our beautiful province of British Columbia, it takes 15 years. And that change in terms of wages and cost of housing is so significant, it literally now is squeezing young people, trapping them between money and time pressures. Young people on average are having to work and study more to have less. And this is now beginning to interfere with their love lives. Something that is far, far from insignificant. A generation ago, the typical 20-something was more likely to be living with her or his lover than her adult parents. If you flash forward to today, it is now reversed. People are far more likely to be living as 20-somethings with their adult parents. This isn't great for the love lives of younger people, it's not great if you believe the Cialis commercials for the love lives of their <laughs> near retiring parents. And without doubt, when you are nearing retirement and thinking about how you're going to stretch your own income into your years as a senior and suddenly you have an adult child at home, that's putting new pressure on retiring. So we see more and more across generations in this country that people are starting to recognize that generations X and Y can't work their way out of this time and money squeeze without giving up something very fundamental. Either you have young couples coping with lower incomes by devoting more and more adult time to the labor market, shifting from 40 to more like 80 hours a week to make household incomes that are going nowhere, simply running faster to stay on the same spot. And in the process, they're postponing and in some instances abandoning altogether, starting the family my otherwise have wanted. Or they start that family, but erode the strategy of more work to fend off lower wages and higher costs of living. For even when people take advantage of our parental leave system to share a year at home with a new baby, the typical young couple will forego about 15 grand from their after-tax income. 15 grand is the equivalent of another mortgage on top of already higher housing prices. And because you can only forego that 15 grand for so long, and leave runs out after a year, many young couples are having to turn to the community to see, are there services like childcare that would enable us to have enough time in the labor market 
to fend off lower wages and higher housing costs. But there are only enough of those spaces for about one in three kids, even if I count every kindergarten space. And for those who can find a space for their child outside of kindergarten, they'll often pay more than university tuition for that space at the very moment many are wanting to pay down their student debt loads. Behold the burdens of generations squeeze when they start their families. At that moment, they become squeezed for time at home with their young kids. They're squeezed for services like childcare, which are in short supply and unaffordable. And they are squeezed for money because their wages are not keeping pace with the cost of living. Now, the squeeze exists partly because of social and economic trends, deteriorations in our surroundings economically. But it also exists because we have failed to adapt in Canada and in British Columbia our policy priorities. Did you know governments across this country spend just as much subsidizing livestock and agriculture as we do subsidizing young parents to spend time at home with a new baby and childcare and early education? Literally, we are putting cattle and young families on the same level of priority in our budgets. That's happening in part because as we've been adapting policy over the last couple of decades, we've been focusing on other issues, not what's been happening for young people, more what's been happening, very important, for our aging population. Between 1976 and today, we have increased the amount we spend each year on medical care by around $50 billion a year. We've increased what we spend on public pensions by around $30 billion a year. These things are important. Meet my mother, Sue Kershaw, who for many years made many sacrifices on my behalf. And you better believe I want her to have a healthy, secure retirement. But my mom's always surprised to learn that between 1976 and today, while we've increased spending for her generation, we have absolutely increased nothing for younger generations when they start their families. And so when you look at how governments spend money and break it down by age in our country, suddenly there is a very interesting pattern. On average, each year, we spend about $45,000 per retiree in this country, compared to just $12,000 a year per younger person. 45 versus 12. Now, let there be no mistake, the spending on retirees is very important stuff. Meet my 97-year-old grandmother, Vivian Lawrence. Today, as I talk to you, she resides in a bed in a hospital in Kelowna. So you better believe I know that the fact that we spend about $13,000 every year per senior on medical care matters. And you better know the fact that she's been a senior almost my entire life means I totally understand the importance of things like the Canada Public Pension Plan and old age security and a range of other supports that subsidize income in retirement. But what's so interesting to me is how when you add up every last dollar we spend on younger people for school, post-secondary, the medical care on which they depend, every support for families that I can think of, and a bunch of other things, it still doesn't even add up to what we spend each year on medical care alone per retiree. The reality is, if you are under 45 and you're looking at that 45 versus $12,000 expenditure, it doesn't look like it's a good deal. Despite all the additional prosperity we witness in Canada today compared to the past, despite being a country who with our natural resources are the envy of so many other countries, the expenditures on younger people look a wee bit scant. At the very least, out of balance. And the, so long as those expenditures remain out of balance, we are leaving starting a family for young people today unaffordable by the standards we had hoped would become the norm a generation ago. And when you look at the first letter in family, and then the first letter in unaffordable, <laughs> that FU is a far greater slap in the face to entire generations in their prime childbearing years than any four letter slur. <coughs> Fortunately, we can change this. Thank you very much. We can change this. We can build a better generational deal that gives all generations a chance. And the secret is we must adapt public policy today for generation squeeze in the same way that we have done and continue to do for retirees. 
There are a range of ways that we could do this. Let me give you a couple of examples. First, if we think it's a problem that today many young families struggle for parents to share a year at home with a new baby, when a generation ago it was common for families to afford to have a parent remain home for several years, then let's make our leave system more generous. Let's make it include those who are self-employed. Let's lengthen it so that we can integrate dads more in the leave program without interfering with women's breastfeeding, because men can never do that. Simultaneously, if we are worried that there's a shortage of childcare services or that they cost more than university tuition, well, let's build more and invest in them to bring the cost down to, say, no more than 10 bucks a day. And if we were to do those two things, we could save the typical young family today around $50,000 before their kids reach the age of six. Not only then are we reducing their time and service squeeze, we are going directly at their income squeeze, and by saving them $50,000, we then ensure that they can achieve better work-life balance for the rest of their kids' lives. We can, without doubt, make it feasible to pay off the average student loan and reduce by years the time it takes to save for a down payment or later pay that mortgage off. And we certainly can let that money ride over time at even modest interest rates and make a major contribution to the savings for retirement that young people are disproportionately struggling with now because jobs so rarely have defined benefit pensions. You might be thinking, but how? How can we go about doing that? Surely that's going to be so expensive. Did you know? It would only take narrowing the gap in our spending between generations a wee little bit. It would take shifting it from about $12,000 per Canadian under age 45 to closer to 13. Did you see it? It's so small. And yet that small change in the environment of younger generations can make a massive difference. Literally, the difference between having to cling on to get by or getting a financial foothold so you can climb to further success. So I hope I hope after hearing this information, you will join the Generation Squeeze campaign. Join us in a common call for our government budgets to stop working only for some, to stop pitting the health of grandparents against the well-being of their kids and grandchildren, to start giving all generations a chance. Thank you very much. <laughs>